to Tobacco Dock. Thank you to BizClick for inviting me to speak about our transformation journey in Macmillan Education. Macmillan Education, for those of you who don't know, is a business that was founded in 1843. And we are present in over 120 countries worldwide. And we have two basic divisions. One is ELT, English Language Teaching primarily in developing countries. Um, secondly, we have schools curriculum business, which is in, again, developing countries like Caribbean, South Africa, etc., and in South America. Now, this business has stayed static for decades, and in its supply chain, when I joined, um, my then boss said to me, I like to recruit people very similar to myself. And I had an interview with him and I said, I don't think I'm similar to yourself. <laughs> and I, I said, and he said, why? I said, well, I actually like to do things. You, you don't seem to want to do anything. You're doing a lot of talking, you've got massive PowerPoint slides, but what's happened? Because what you've just described to me doesn't seem to change and has not changed for almost eight, since 1843. <laughs> However, he laughed and he did decide to employ me. Now, I think it's fair to say that this company is very conservative when it comes to supply chain. It's very sales driven, so the regional sales teams are very quick to escalate if there's a supply chain problem. And it's all about noise, it's a supply chain issue, they're the ones to blame. Now I'll explain and you'll see some of the dynamics that actually go on that actually cause us some problems that are driven by the sort of sales guys I'm describing. Now they're all great people, I get on well with them, but they do create some challenges. So what I've got now is a little video that'll just give you a bit more context about what I inherited and some of the things that drove why I wanted to make some changes. So there's a quick video that I'd like to just play you now. Book publishing has moved online and is moving much more to digital, as you'd expect. Okay, I'm Sean Plunkett, I'm the Vice President of Global Supply Chain for Macmillan Education. Some of the other pressures that are coming on many organisations now around things like sustainability. You know, our carbon footprint was way too high because we're air freighting putting on a boat all around the world and then shipping it all the way back to where it started. So we had to completely re-engineer the supply chain. And one of the key things that I proposed was much more of an integrated supply chain, locally based. Our business is very much around English language teaching. That's Macmillan, that's what it's all about. And that's typically in developing countries. Now, a lot of the bandwidth and infrastructure is not there to support big download files. So hence, we still need a physical presence. So if I could move everything to local, it meant I could dramatically save our freight costs. So our freight costs have come down by over 90% as a result of this change. Um, and our carbon footprint has obviously improved dramatically. Mm -hmm. So you could see that a lot of those pointers of sustainability um, were driving our, our initiative. The quality of our archiving was very poor. So we had to invest in that. And that was another big digital transformation was getting all of our files properly digitized and then be able to, at a moment's notice, be able to distribute those globally to anywhere, wherever there was demand. So we've now built that infrastructure and that was a cornerstone that was missing. We have a lot of confidence in that digital supply chain now and it gives us great agility. And the COVID times, interestingly enough, have demonstrated that because a lot of lockdowns have taken place. So we've been able to, at very short notice, make, make our content available digitally to support teachers, students when they've been working at home, uh, offer free content as necessary, etc., so that they can continue their education. Okay, so that gives you a little bit of flavor as to why we were trying to change and what some of the drivers were. 
Okay, for those of you who worked for an accountant, I have several times for COOs. Um, this is the only page they're interested in in any presentation. Show me the benefits. Um, you've probably all been in those meetings. If they don't like the numbers, the meeting's over. So just as the rain starts to get louder, I'll try and speak up a little bit. Anyway, some of the benefits. Seven million savings annually recurring. Plus, there'll be another two to three million by the end of this year. We've reduced our global stocks, staggeringly, from 13 and a half million down to about three million globally. Service levels have actually gone up. So we're now typically first time fill rate of over 99% in our supply chain. The lead times have also dramatically come down. Most entertainment businesses I've ever worked in, they all had typically sourced in the Far East with long lead times and it was all driven by the classic metrics that we as senior executives are all tasked to get lower cost every year. And that was the reason for that model. Everything was about lowest, low unit cost, manufacture as much as you can on a forecast that was given months, if not nine months in some cases, earlier. So the accuracy of that forecast was horrendous and the implications are horrendous and I'll explain that in a minute. What we did, as I said in that video, was we localized our supply chain. So we have created hubs in the regions where the sales take place. So in that hub, we have printing, we have storage and fulfillment, all in one location. We also have digital and offset, which is the tra traditional long print run capabilities, all in one physical building. So there is no freight cost involved in that model. We've literally eliminated it. We also have negotiated with all our vendors a totally variable cost model. So we're only paying for what we use. Whereas in the past, we used to own all those facilities, we used to pay for all that fixed cost, we had all that seasonality, and all of that cost we had to bear. We've now extracted that from the supply chain, and it's part of the benefits. We've also supported Springer Nature is the broader group in which Macmillan Education sit. We've supported all of our CSR goals by these initiatives. So, I go back to the traditional model. What we used to call it, print, store, and prey. The prey, have I got enough stock? Oh shit, I haven't got enough stock. And what that meant was, most of the operations were absolutely screaming at supply chain from the regions. And what it meant was we always had emergencies. And those emergencies typically incurred massive freight costs, typically air freighting, as you can imagine. And if you think back to the, the period we're still in in COVID, air freight, container ships, they're not the things you want your goods stuck on. Our service levels were appalling when I started. Massive complaints from all regions about the service we were offering. We didn't even measure service. I'm, I'm saying it's 85 to 90, I'm not even sure. And at certain times, it was way below that. So what we needed to do, did we just tinker with our supply chain? Do we do a step change? No. I prefer to do something radical and bold. Now, again, I go back to we're a conservative business. So that was a big challenge to get the business to buy into that but we literally completely re-engineered the model. So what were those limitations of that old supply chain? As I said, typical long lead times, three to four months. Now, when you have new products, creative industries typically what you find is they always chew up time. So they never get their products there on time. And guess what? Supply chain has to pick up the pieces. Now, us picking up the pieces when we're taking three or four months, we got no chance of recovering. And that was typically the problem. We were buffered and then we were running late and that affects sales inevitably. So that's why we're getting the pressure, that's why we're getting the complaints. The poor forecast accuracy, forecast accuracy, no accountability. The central team 
had the ownership of that stock and it sat on our balance sheet. So the regions had no responsibility for their forecast and no ownership. So inevitably, they didn't really care. They would just order more, and if they weren't sure, just in case there was a panic, like toilet rolls, as we heard earlier, or petrol, let's order a bit more. And then let's air freight it just to rub it in. Inevitably, high inventory levels. We had a stock turn of less than one when I started. Our stock turn is three and a half now. Those high freight costs were killing us as an operation. So we were trying to keep costs down, so every time we tried to get our manufacturing unit costs down, we then started air freighting it. And as now we've hit the pandemic, you can see how we would have been totally screwed by that if we continued that model. The waste levels were atrocious. In the first year I joined, I had to scrap one and a half million books in our central warehouse. I don't know how many containers that is, but let's just say that's a shed load of money. That's probably five million euros to us that we just had to write off. Obviously an excessive carbon footprint. You'll see in a, uh, a map I'll show in a second. We were like a spider's web in terms of our supply chain. We're shipping stuff here, shipping it there, and then we'll ship it back to the same place it was manufactured. Our stock availability, as I said, inevitably with these issues, was also poor. We either had massive stocks and no, no sales, or we had lots of key titles out of stock. So a pretty disastrous situation. This was the model. So as I say, 90% of our manufacturing was in Asia. These little blue dots, if you can see those, they were all our key printers. We had a few printers that were closer to our central warehouse. All of our stock was also located in one central warehouse for the whole world, in Swansea, in Wales. Our planning um, was done in Hong Kong, and all our sourcing, we had a big team I inherited when I first joined, sitting in Hong Kong, Malaysia, Singapore, and they were buying paper they thought they could buy paper really well. When we looked at it, deep dive, we saw that actually they were paying more than 20% above market rate. But actually it was a bit of a toy for them. They liked looking at paper, they liked visiting paper mills in China. But the reality was we weren't getting an effective cost. We didn't have the scale. We needed to partner with the right people. Go with these printers, find the right partners. So that was the old model. So what have we done? We've created all of these hubs. So these little diagrams are hubs in our key selling regions. So these hubs, as I said earlier, they are the center of the world for that selling location. Everything can be supplied at very short notice now in all of these regions. We've decentralized all of the sourcing and planning to those regions. So the sales teams now, I've actually put my teams in with those sales teams in all the regions. So they work collaboratively now, rather than adversarially in the past. Obviously the logistics are simplified enormously. We don't do any air freight. It's gone. We don't need to. Container ships, we don't have them. We don't need to use them. The reality is, we store where we can locally the critical items. So if there are uh, probably 5,000 SKUs that we're typically supporting, probably 400 represent between 80 and 85% of our turnover. So those are the ones we stock in the location and the ones that we don't are now stored, uh, sorry, are now printed either digitally for auto replenishment or true print on demand where the customer needs it, and we'll also customize all of that content as they need it on a real order coming into us. There are further hubs to come, probably in China, probably three. There'll also be Dubai to serve the Gulf, and I'm opening one up in Brazil as we speak. So what next? 
previous speaker talked about SAP. We're embarking on a, an ERP implementation. Now, all of this was done with no systems, virtually. All of those savings were delivered. So, I agree with the previous speaker, there's a lot of benefits of putting the right systems in, making sure your data is correct, etc. However, you can still make massive change and deliver it um, without those infrastructures in place. It facilitates, obviously, our ability to leave the UK warehouse. The reality is we had a sister company, we were sold, their ARP system was 30 years old. It sits on an AS400 green screen system. That's how old we're talking. I remember that at university, just to give you an idea. <laughs> so that does need to be replaced as a minimum. We are going to do that. It gets us out of the UK, and then I can establish two other hubs in Spain and Poland. Again, two of our key markets. Product rationalization, that's another one that the sales teams, marketing, didn't seem to get. They had this enormous tail of product that wasn't really selling, but obviously they had all the stock across all those product lines. Now for me, you need to focus your sales teams on the things that are selling and the fresh products. So for example, in Asia, they were selling products that were 20 years old. Now a lot of these products we can't make physically anymore. We have no components. They're selling things with CDs in that don't work. So we have to try and educate people. The other thing is, when we've moved to digital, we've had to simplify. So often the digital printing does not equal the old traditional offset printing. And you have to modify and simplify those products to be able to offer down to one book. Obviously the expansion on print on demand and print to order is another thing we're driving forward. Some of the technology in certain regions is not as advanced. So for example, in Asia, interesting enough, they haven't had as much thinking around the digital investment. They've always traditionally uh, gone with offset printing and done long print runs. And it's, to be fair, I haven't seen many Chinese printers actually come to the table with an offering like this hub that I've implemented. So the way we convinced our other vendors was I took them to Singapore, to our first hub. And this hub is a blue case you know, for us as a business. So I get the guys to go there, see the model, the lights come on, and they start replicating it for me. I haven't even got a contract with these vendors, but they bought into the strategy. And we're already seeing the vendors already supporting this sort of event and also they supported the paper that I wrote around that BizClick invited me to do. And they are committed to this strategy and journey because they see there's an end game with them. They will, they will grab all of the business in the region and they become the epicenter for our business. Okay, some of the lessons learned, I think, on any transformation journey. Obviously, the basic one for me, you have to get your stakeholders on board. If they're not buying into this strategy, you've got no chance. And you have to keep them informed through the whole journey. There is no compromise there. If they hear a surprise or they hear a complaint, they need to know what the status is. You need to be honest with them. Tell them the truth. The other one was ensuring the implementation team could be the champions. So I made sure all of the, all of the team were fully engaged with the project, knew where we were going on the journey. So it wasn't just they only knew their own local story, they knew the whole picture. So when they got challenges, they could explain it and articulate and convince local management if they were wobbling about the changes that were going on. You're inevitably going to get some of those in any transformation. Obviously being bold, I prefer that as a strategy. Not everyone feels comfortable, I accept that. But I think in this scenario that had been stuck for 30 years in a particular working model, it needed a radical change. You had to put a stick in the spoke and stop that wheel spinning and do something fundamentally different. You obviously need some quick wins. Um, and I go back to my accountant friends earlier. They need to see some numbers. So you've got to give them some benefits, inevitably. The other one, obviously, is that classic trick, we do need to balance strategy and day-to-day. -day. 
I couldn't just think about the strategy all day long and then forget we've got some day-to-day -day business. That had to still continue and we were still able to make some improvements. So although it was a, on a shaky foundation, we still managed to optimize what we had before we could implement these hubs. The other one was consistent measurement uh, and communication, both internally and externally, because our suppliers also needed to be fully engaged. Some of the suppliers we had to manage, they didn't want to go on the journey, so we had to lose them. Um, but that still need managing, otherwise you create, again, further supply chain problems. Again, previous speaker talked about you know, resilience and obviously supporting our sustainability goals. This has dramatically supported the, the group goals on our CSR objectives. Okay. Anyone had any questions? That was great. Thank you very much, Sean. Thank you. Um, so we have actually had uh, a fair few questions come in, and, and, okay. and they're, they're very interesting. So we'll try and get through as many as possible. And the first one is you've mentioned sustainability goals a few times. What actually are you aiming for? Are you aiming for carbon neutral? Is that even possible in a global publishing business? Yeah, I mean, the, the whole group is committed to carbon neutral. Um, so we've got clear, clear goals and we've got clear plans to deliver on that. Yeah. Now, it's, it's not all uh, plain sailing. We've had some bumps to say along the road. Yeah. But I think, uh, yeah, that's our, that's our clear objective. And I would say in the next two to three years, that's pretty much where we'll be. Yeah, and because you no longer have this one central hub and you're shipping things out around the world, yep. does that actually make it easier or harder to manage that? Obviously, reducing the use of tankers and planes is going to help, mm. but, but how do you manage the supply chain when actually there's lots of different mini supply chains feeding into one big one? Well, because I've decentralized the team, they are focused on that hub. So they have full ownership. They have full, full ownership of relationships with all the local sales teams. So they manage all that forecast discussion now. They're managing and deciding which products they're going to support. They're much closer linked than we were in the past. In the past, we were so far removed, we were nowhere near hearing half of those conversations. Yeah. So inevitably, we missed half of the noise or the concerns that they had and just let it run. And inevitably, we made mistakes. Whereas now they're much closer, they're actually getting to the pulse of things and can make the right decisions and also react. The other thing we're seeing is, for example, in, in Brazil, because we've digitized all our assets, one of our printers went down, and within 24 hours, we were able to supply all print files to another printer in Brazil yeah. and resupply the schools. And literally that, that within, within wouldn't days. Have been possible if you... In the old model, we would have just completely fallen over yeah. and lost the sales permanently. Because the trouble with the schools is they don't, they're not going to be forgiving. If you miss that selling season of when, I mean, if any of you have children, you go back to school and your, your children don't have any books, that's not uh, going to get a good reaction. Yeah. Now, Macmillan Education is not a small business. So how did you take the business on the journey? You mentioned there were some suppliers that, that clearly weren't coming on the journey with you, and that was to be expected. But how do you take a business of your size and that's been doing things the same way for so long on this complete transformation? OK, well, the first year, um, I traveled over 100,000 miles in a plane. And I didn't come with a blueprint when I first joined and said, this is the answer. It was very much around, I want to hear what the markets want from their supply chain and the customers. So I met all key customers in all markets, as well as all the key stakeholders, the regional managing directors, et cetera, and their teams. Understood their requirements, and then I built the plan that said, this is what I think will work for you and give you a much better service, um, give you sales opportunities. Again, go back to Brazil. They've actually seen incremental sales as a result of this implementation yeah. because of the quick response locally. We were able to get you know, samples to a school within 24 hours, and that was critical because nobody else could do that in yeah. that business. That makes sense. Uh, I'm being told we're out of time. I've got one, I'm going to sneak one last question in because I think <laughs> okay. it's interesting. Um, someone's asked, will Brexit negatively impact you or will you adapt in the same way as you did with COVID-19? Honestly, Brexit has had an impact um, because we've still got our warehouse in Wales. Um, we haven't been able to close it yet. And I will tell you for now, a lot of our suppliers in the first three months couldn't get into the UK. Real problems. Um, getting out was equally challenging. So. I am exiting completely from the UK. 
not a very British thing to do, perhaps, but uh, that's, I think it's the right thing to do for our business. Our sales, to be fair, are less than 1% in the UK. So we've got a warehouse and we've got no sales in that country. So it's totally counter to the model I've built. That makes sense. Sean, thank you very much for your time. Appreciate no, thank you very much for giving me a chance to speak. Thank you.